I'd never been afraid before. Anxious, sure. I'd worried about terrorists and getting killed in a plane crash, losing all my money in the stock market, or getting hit by a drunk driver. Never afraid. Certainly never afraid of anything supernatural. Ghosts, goblins, monsters, and the like. Not because I was too tough to be afraid of them, but just because I didn't believe in them. How could you be afraid of something that didn't exist? I was about to find out how wrong I was. God, was I wrong. Hang on. Let me start a little earlier. Let me provide some background. Here is the revised text in the style of Jordan Group. We had only recently relocated to Indianapolis from Texas, where we had spent the last six years and raised both of our children. I was offered a new position, which necessitated the move. The job is what brought us from Ohio to Texas, but after six years we agreed that we were not cut out for the southern U.S. The desert of southwest Texas was no place for a couple of Yankees like us. When we got to Indiana, we figured we'd rent for a while until we could sell the place in Texas and find a new spot for the family, a forever home. I had landed a job working in downtown Indianapolis, and there was some gentrification going on within a five-mile radius of my office. It was an old house that had been fixed up by the owner with grants from the city council, or some shit like that. The first visit we made to the house was with the owner when we went to do an initial walkthrough of the property. When we arrived, we found that the owner hadn't yet arrived, so my wife and I drove around the circular gravel driveway and parked beside my car, and the kids and I all got out and walked around the house, taking a look. It was a very large house. I suppose they all were around here. They were all brick and had slate roofs and adorned with limestone frames around the windows and various other decorative frills, some even sporting a gargoyle or two. Although this house did not, to my disappointment. I'd be damned if it wasn't completely clean and free of any signs of disrepair, however. Somehow, I don't think the owner's name was Lenny, but that's what we'll call him. He was a pretty laid-back guy, a bit of a smartass, but not any more than I'd expect, I guess. He seemed to like our children and didn't seem to mind our dog. He pointed out the brick pointing, the new slate roof, and fresh glazing on the windows. When he was done with the tour, we headed around the back to enter through one of the rear doors. The first thing that man said was that the interior of the house didn't match the exterior. The freshness of the beauty was only skin deep. When he opened the door, the stale smell of the neglected space assaulted my nostrils, and I could see immediately that the hallway was cast in shadow. None of the thin curtains had been open, and only minor shafts of sunlight found their way through, highlighting the dust motes drifting in the air. By the time we completed the tour, I agreed that the old house needed a lot of attention, but it somehow still held some charm. The hallway leading to the rear entrance was tiled with a dated hexagon-patterned ceramic floor, and there was a tiny half-bath to my left, just inside the entry. I had to bend to keep from hitting my head in the small bathroom. At 6'4", I didn't fit in a lot of these older houses too comfortably, but I was grateful they at least thought to include a shower in an ensuite upstairs. The same tile continued until the hall transitioned to hardwood about halfway down the length of the hall. A few more steps, and the hallway opened into the foyer. Then I caught sight of the massive stained glass chandelier that hung from the ceiling, suspended in front of a full three stories of space. A standard swinging door led to a small kitchen area just to the right of the dining room area, though the height of the door was a bit jarring after having seen the other doors, which had all been nearly nine feet in height. The kitchen was devoid of anything remotely modern, aside from the sink. I was surprised it even had running water at this point. Lenny told us if our refrigerator was too big, he had a smaller one he could bring over from another one of his rental properties. There were three more doors in the room, two that led to the dining room and out to the backyard, and one that went down to the basement. The basement was a nightmare, though. The steps were the steep, single-flight variety, and they dropped the full height of the basement floor, probably twenty feet or so. There were bare bulbs in each of the eight rooms to either side of the staircase, and the whole place gave me the willies. It had the expected dripping pipes, and inexplicably, chains hung from hooks set into the block walls. 
The end of the subterranean room was dominated by a huge gravity furnace, blackened with age, service, and neglect. It looked like some sort of monstrous steel behemoth crouching in the corner of that southernmost room, extending a half dozen steel tentacles up into the first floor above. The floor around it was littered with sheaves of paper and toppled boxes, and the walls on that end of the room were lined with closed steel cabinets that I'd never had the courage to explore. The bedrooms were spread between the second and third floors, and I noted the niche in the wall where an old-fashioned servant bell system was still attached. They were bells mounted on springs where chains led to each of the rooms above. At Lenny's insistence, we had already collectively drawn straws to see which poor staffer would have the privilege of sleeping up in the attic, over the washroom. The upstairs bedrooms were pretty standard fare, other than the massive doorways and fireplaces in each one. The two bathrooms on each floor were also tiled in the same hexagonal pattern as the foyer and included honest-to-God old-school clawfoot tubs. Lenny also pointed out something else odd about the house. In the rear of each bedroom closet was an access panel to a narrow corridor. He opened one of them and revealed a rat's maze of cramped hallways that ran behind the lath and plaster walls and interconnected most of the bedrooms. Why they were there, my guess is just the sort of shit you'd find in an odd house like this one. Like I said, that house was a little too spooky for my taste. Let's do it! If that house was ever going to produce some of that creepy, hair-raising shit, it would have been then. And man did it. It was well into fall, and the apple tree in the backyard was shedding its overripe fruit, creating a pungent, rotting aroma from where the ground was scattered with the fallen apples. Needing a break from that task, I was sitting on a turned-over bucket in the garage, making a mental inventory of my surroundings. The walls were red brick with a slate roof and two large carriage-style doors. The driveway was plenty wide, turning around at the rear of the house and leading back out to the street. We never parked our cars in here, though. There was no need. I couldn't even really remember the last time I'd been in here at all. The day we moved in, I suppose, when I directed the movers to stack some things in here that we wouldn't be needing until we were settled and moved out of this in-between house. For some reason, at that moment, I decided to take a better look around. The garage was a pretty big space, probably about a 40-foot square, like everything else on the property. There were no regular lights, but the sun was still shining outside, so I let it slide. I hadn't been out here since we moved in, so I didn't even bother trying any of the doors. It was plenty bright from the two sets of huge carriage doors. I fit my fingers in around one and pushed it open enough to squeeze inside. After shuffling around a bit, I felt the chain my father-in-law mentioned hanging below several of the ceiling beams and pulled the first one. A single naked bulb flickered to life nearby as I headed further in, pulling the chains on the beams as I came to them until most of the garage floor was lit. The only things in the garage were the stack of slate shingle bundles in the corner and all of our other shit, the lawnmower, garden tools, a couple of boxes of my bigger shop tools, and some boxes of miscellanea that we hadn't needed since moving in, were all piled along the opposite wall. I wasn't sure exactly how heavy roof slates were, but they all looked the same as the one I was now holding, so I figured they were pretty close to the same weight. The roof on just the garage must have been hundreds of pounds, and all that slate in the house but I could see the beams of the garage ceiling above the open rafters of the attic space, and I could hear a scratching, tapping sound from up there. The garage was built with an open ceiling in this part of it, and about a quarter of the beams had wooden planks over them, effectively constructing a rudimentary floor over parts of the beams. It was a handy bit of additional storage space, I supposed, but was probably full of mice in a house as old as this one. Hard to believe I was going to have to evict another raccoon or some such varmint from the attic above the garage. I didn't really feel like it was our responsibility to do so. I mean, it's not like we were going to be setting up permanent residence here or anything. I'm sure the damn thing had been living here longer than we had been here already, but I didn't want to take the chance of some rabid animal attacking the kids if they decided to explore the garage looking for something to play with. 
I looked up towards the darkness and allowed my eyes to adjust, scanning for any movement. Ah, there it was. Something moved incredibly quickly, but only for a fraction of a second. I startled so badly that I involuntarily dropped the slate tile I had spied upon the thing that now obscured my vision, and it shattered at my feet. I hadn't seen it more than a blur out of the corner of my eye, and only very briefly, but it didn't seem to be an animal that I recognized. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine, but figured it was just my unease brought on by the darkness, in a strange place, and generally just feeling out of sorts. The stress of the move had my nerves on edge already. I used the shovel to gather up the broken pieces and walked them around to the back of the garage, tossing them onto a small pile of rocks and bricks left by a previous renter. I went back into the garage, turned out the lights, and closed the door. That evening, after I'd gotten the kids to bed and we'd had dinner, my wife and I were curled up by the fire I'd built in the fireplace. The old house got damn cold at night, even with the furnace on full blast. Hey babe, I think we have some varmints in the garage. Rats? My wife said, looking up with raised eyebrows. No, it wasn't that big. Probably a raccoon or something. I only got a glimpse of it, but it was pretty good sized. Shit, what do we do? Those kids? What if that dog is rabid? She said, aghast. Tomorrow, I'll call an exterminator. I'm not interested in dealing with it on my own. Who knows what other sorts of nasties are out there. I'm a lover, not a fighter. My wife's smile answered my question, and I decided I'd let her take care of the problem at hand. It would be out of here before long. It was then we started to talk about how happy we were that the move was finally behind us. From there, we moved to what we'd do next, finding a more permanent residence, and then to ways we could make this place a little less foreboding until then. A fresh coat of paint, perhaps? We definitely need to change out the carpet runner on the staircase. As I was thinking this, one of the bells in the alcove rattled. What the hell? I said, and headed to the front hall, opening the door to find a switch on the wall next to the doorway. The kids must have hit this when they came charging in as they were running through the house. I flicked it off and closed the door, making my way back into the room and calling up the staircase banister. Hey, you two, quit horsing around and get back to bed. You're not sleeping in here. I didn't hear any response, but that didn't necessarily mean anything. I glanced back out the window and noticed movement down in the shadows at the entrance to the garage again. I jerked my thumb up the staircase and said to Sue, I better go make sure they're not getting into anything. I trotted back to the staircase and up to the second floor, checking the kids in their room. Both were sleeping, and the lights were still off. I felt my stomach flip uneasily. What had I seen moving in the garage? I hoped it was just a raccoon. If it was that, however, then it might have been attracted to another infestation in the house. I needed to make a complete sweep of the place to make sure there weren't any mice or rats inside. About half an hour later, Sue and I decided to go up to bed. Glancing in the kids' room on our way past, I saw that they were still tucked in and already sleeping, fortunately. The last thing we needed was them wandering around the house our first night here. I had started a fire in the little fireplace in the master bedroom, and Sarah and I had fallen asleep as it burned low. I was groggily aware of the tinkling of the bell again. Huh? I stumbled from our room and quietly padded down the stairs to the first floor hallway, checking the kids' rooms. Both boys were still fast asleep. The bell rang once more, and I sprinted down into the first floor hallway in time to see the bell labeled Master Bedroom shake on its mounting. Baffled, I went back upstairs. You rang? I asked my wife as I walked back into our room. What the hell? Were you just pulling that cord to fuck with me, or were you just so anxious to meet me? She looked a bit confused. Huh. I didn't flush the toilet. I didn't think she was being entirely truthful, but I didn't disbelieve her. Hell, we'd been married long enough for me to read her pretty well. I frowned and tried to come to terms with the fact that we likely had a rodent in the house somewhere. What else could it be? A mouse, I supposed, 
running over the pull chain for the bell behind the walls of the house as it traveled through the ductwork or pipe chases. I'd be calling Lenny first thing in the morning to chew him a new ass. We must have drifted off at some point, even though the bell rang two or three more times during the night. Lenny complained a bit that, I don't know what the hell you expected from me, but I don't see any damn rodents. But he agreed to call someone to come out and take a look. He had a guy for everything, plumbing, landscaping, and now pest control. The exterminator ended up setting a baited cage trap for the raccoon in the garage. He searched around the basement and closets for signs of mice or rats, droppings, nests, that sort of thing. But when he didn't find any, he said he'd put some glue traps under our furniture and near the baseboards. He said that they were safer than snap traps for a household with kids. Both my wife and I balked at the thought of the poor mouse starving to death or dying of thirst if it were to get itself stuck in a glue trap. So we declined. The Terminator, that's what my kids called him, said he'd need to set some bait traps instead. He said that Lenny wouldn't be happy about the additional services, but I could tell he was happy to have an excuse to sell me more stuff. He said the traps had bait in them that the pests would eat and then crawl away and die someplace else where they couldn't be reached by the kids or pets. He assured me that the pests would bleed out within a couple of days and we shouldn't even have to know it. It all still sounded pretty gross to me, but at least we didn't have to worry about the problem anymore. We waited a week or so, but never caught any more of the little bastards in the cage trap outside and the damned bell kept ringing all night. Sometimes in ours, sometimes in the boys, and sometimes in the unoccupied rooms. I called the exterminator again, and he said that that Lenny had come out and told him to just lay down those dang sticky traps. He refilled the garage trap with the special bait and told us to stay away from it. A couple more days passed with no activity in the traps. I'd been checking constantly at first, then daily, but hadn't had any luck at getting rid of the little bastards myself. That's when I went on the web to see if I could find any homemade solutions. I'd seen a video where you rubber banded some paper over a five gallon bucket and cut a cross in the top where you set your bait, which then fell to the bottom of the bucket once the critter went for it. It didn't seem like a very fast process, catching them one at a time. But something was better than nothing, right? I'd made one, placing a peanut butter and cheese cracker in the back of our master bedroom closet, where I'd seen some droppings and evidence on top of some of our shoes. Ain't nothing happened that first night. The next night, about halfway through my sleep, I was startled awake by a loud clatter of something hitting the bucket. And it had to be a something, and a big something, and it had to be a rat, right? In my underwear, and without my shoes, I threw open the closet door. Gotcha now, you little shit. I can still see it in my mind's eye. It was such an unsettling and unnerving thing to witness. It was small, and it reached up and over the lip of the bucket, and wasn't a mouse or rat or a raccoon, none of which grow to a foot tall, which this thing would have been standing at full height. It was vaguely humanoid, but I can assure it was anything but a man. Extremely gaunt and pallid skin, eye the size of saucers and as black as night, no visible iris. It had ear and nose holes and no visible hair. When it turned to look at me, it showed a row of wide, human-like teeth in a human mouth. No genitals visible, but a weirdly elongated head on a thin, skeletal neck. I thought it had a grin face, as it was covered in folds of loose, slack skin. And the strangest thing was when it showed me that human grin. There wasn't a folio of black spots in its mouth. Incredibly, it looked human in every sluggish detail. It didn't look like the kind of thing that you could skin a child but I hadn't seen those in 30 years at least. I can only describe its teeth as bright white human teeth you are. Its skull and trunk were almost completely emaciated, skin closely but not deformed eye sockets set into a sarlacc of lips. My heart racing, I ran to the bedroom door and threw the lights. Jesus H. Christ! Shit! Fuck! The way I had scared my partner, she would have said I startled like that wish she had been here to see it. I ran to the children's rooms and opened the doors and turned on the lights in all of the rooms along the hallway and a few more in the rest of the house for good measure, but I left the one in the basement storage room off. 
That one always made me a little uneasy, even on a warm day. The four of us sat in the living room. I was shirtless and shivering with the cold and with the insanity of it all when I turned to them and said, All right, enough of this shit. We're not staying here tonight. Put some damn clothes on. We'll go find a hotel. That's crazy, my wife said. We're not going anywhere. What happened? I'd brought her away from the boys so they wouldn't overhear, and now I filled her in on what I found. Please, she pleaded. You have to be rational about this. Things like that don't exist. It was probably just a rat or a squirrel. It was nighttime. You were still sleeping. I don't know, honey. Again, I hoped it was. Anything had looked like a rat if it was my imagination. If it was what I thought it was. I relaxed a bit. My wife managed to get the kids back to sleep, and I got a tea and sat in one of the tubs for a bath. Eventually, I was relaxed enough to return to bed. As I drifted off, a bell rang. Each night grew more and more uncomfortable. The bells kept ringing, and the weird thumping sounds from the shadows grew louder. The panels began slamming closed seemingly at random. Twice, the closet door had stopped creaking open, and even once, I thought, briefly, that I had seen something moving in the shadows outside the cracked door. When I awoke suddenly to some atonal noise from beside my bed and found myself staring right at it in the darkness, I leapt up again and turned on the lights. You little shit! I never saw it, but I heard it heading for the closet and followed it in time to see it disappear through the panel in the back of the closet and into the hidden passage. This was getting ridiculous. I had to put a stop to it. I came running back out with the flashlight from my nightstand drawer and went into the closet and threw on a t-shirt and ducked through the panel at the back of the closet. Since the day we'd moved in, I'd never been back in these passages. I'm sure when I was a kid I would have checked them out that day, but that level of expedition had been driven out of me by years of inactivity. The hallways all had rough wooden floors, but here the planks were not laid neatly with wide gaps between them and I could only see the backsides of the walls, including the laths and what had been wet plaster at one time and dried and set over the lath frame. Oddly, there weren't any cobwebs, and it looked like there were quite a few footprints in the dust on the floor, a great deal of which had drifted in through the open bedroom doorway. They definitely all appeared to be from the same set of shoes, boots, or feet, likely the ones that had just run by a moment ago, but there were probably hundreds of them just in this small area in front of the bed. It occurred to me there was no reason that they couldn't be from the same one individual. With a little time, which apparently it had, the footprints would become so layered that they may look like there were hundreds of steps. I'd have spent more time in them if I wasn't nearly forgotten the reason I was even here when I heard the second thud in the passage behind me. Flicking my light that direction, I followed the passage as it ducked and lowered, guessing the people were shorter when the house was built. Either way, I didn't image these passages were for anything other than utility. I was able to negotiate another few entrances, and spotted one leading to the second floor, another to the first, and another that I assumed went to the cellar. The only reason I could maintain a quick pace was the unceasing sounds of the bumping. Whatever he was, he was clearly not concerned with my presence, and I wasn't chasing him too far. If anything, he was leading me, and if I wanted to find this asshole, I needed to follow. I didn't want to be chased down here either, but once I was determined, I was determined. I continued for a while longer until I reached the end of the passage. It wasn't a particularly long passageway, but I had no idea how far I had gone. I did notice another of the iron slat doors high in the wall as I neared the end of the passage and realized that I must have reached one of the coal bins that had been walled off when the gravity furnace had been converted to heating oil. Lenny hadn't been teaching his drama class in forever, but I wasn't sure I'd believed him. A dim light shone in the room from the moonlit window, even with its grime and filth. Not enough to really see well, though. I turned in a slow circle, flashing my light everywhere around me, realizing then that there were dozens of the little shits all over the place. They seemed to be in no fear of me, and they sure as shit didn't seem to be any threat to me. I thought that was a comfort. Then, I thought that was a surprise issue of disturbed whatever, 
even in my condensed state of relaxation about the situation, but it didn't bother me too much. At least now I knew what I'd been fucking with for the last month or so. Suddenly, that comfort seemed to drain away, as the one that I'd seen in my room a couple of times, the one that was in my closet just an hour before, ran forward and thrust the cracker, half buried in mud and filth, up at me, chattering, More! That was enough to send me running out of that room and up the cellar steps, slamming and bolting the door behind me. I poured a glass of water at the kitchen sink, carried it into the living room, and dropped onto the couch, still breathing heavily and nearly hyperventilating. Minutes ticked by before my heartbeat slowed back to something closer to a normal rhythm. I reasoned with myself that nothing had really changed, and they had demonstrated that they were able to move about the house freely. I eventually managed to drift back off to sleep, but I never fell into a deep sleep and woke with any sound I thought I heard. I tossed and turned the rest of the night until the sun began to brighten the rooms of the house in the early morning, at which point I returned to the kitchen and made a pot of coffee. At five after eight, I placed the call to the exterminator. I didn't want to wait for anyone else to call him, but I also didn't want to leave a message. I needed to speak to him directly. Fortunately, he said he'd be out to see us first thing this morning. While I waited for him to arrive, I poured myself a cup of coffee. The more I thought about it, the more sure I was that it was all just a silly nightmare. I must have just fallen asleep on the couch last night and dreamt it all. Yeah, that was definitely what happened. I'd still have the exterminator check the basement and the rest of the traps, though. I met him back behind the building as he was getting out of his pickup. I did my best to relate my nightmare in an offhand manner. It sounded so ridiculous when I described it. He managed a brief smile, but it didn't seem to tickle him as funny as it should have. Maybe he was just not in a good mood this morning. The garage. He opened the door a crack and shone his flashlight around for a few seconds before turning back to me and frowning. Probably best if you stay right there. I think we have some more of our little friends inbound. What is it? I asked. Raccoons? Maybe rats? I hope it's not rats. No, it's not that bad. He shook his head. But you should probably grab some peanut butter and cheese crackers anyway. 